Hello, good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Steve Trotter and I'm your compare for this evening's talk. Um, my day job is uh, Chief Executive for Cumbria Wildlife Trust and we're one of the lead organisations for Get Cumbria Buzzing. And everybody involved with the Get Cumbria Buzzing partnership is really excited about this evening's talk from Professor Dave Goulton of the University of Sussex, one of the world's foremost invertebrate exp experts. And uh, I'll introduce Dave in a moment, but the story behind this event is that Get Cumbria Buzzing is currently involved in a project to promote pollinators in the northwest of Cumbria uh, with eight partners who are listed on the holding slide at the beginning. And our project is restoring wildflowers to verges on main roads and public spaces uh, around West Cumbria for pollinators. And uh, we're also doing loads of public engagement and lots of community, uh, local community activities, uh, which includes producing a pollinator map, a pollinator atlas for Cumbria. All thanks to funding largely from Highways England and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, plus a few others and the, and the partners themselves. Um, before coronavirus hit, we had planned to run a week-long pollinator festival in Carlisle and West Cumbria. Um, and Dave had very kindly agreed to travel the length of the country to be the headline speaker for the festival. And obviously this was cancelled uh, in the light of lockdown, so we have moved online. And uh, so many wildlife trusts are involved in a national campaign to reverse declines in invertebrates, uh, the Action for Insects campaign that we thought uh, more people might like to hear the lecture. So we've opened it up to a wider audience, which uh, I hope everybody will enjoy. And we had around 2,000 people booked on the, the evening call. So uh, there's lots of people that you won't be able to see from your, from your uh, sitting rooms, wherever you are. Um, we're all deeply concerned about the decline in pollinators and invertebrates. Uh, and we believe that it's vital to take action now for insects if we're not to cause a major ecological disaster, both locally and internationally. And certainly speaking from a Cumbria Wildlife Trust perspective, I think many of us were aware of the declines in the wider landscape. And we've been working for insect conservation for decades. But what really brought it home for us in a shocking way was the study published in 2017 on nature reserves in Germany, which showed a catastrophic decline of 76 percent of uh, abundance of in invertebrates on, on nature reserves. You know, and this is not just the wider countryside. This was nature reserves. So an alarm call that we really do have a massive problem on our hands and we need to take action. And uh, Professor Goulson also authored a key report for the Wildlife Trust on the decline of insects, which uh, is available to download. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, it's a superb evidence-based and accessible report uh, that I can re recommend highly to you. Um, so I hope you can take action, whether in your garden, in your local community. Uh, please do support your local wildlife uh, charities. Uh, you know, you can volunteer or make a donation to your local wildlife trust, or even better, join them. And as they're all doing brilliant work uh, and need your support, as do Bug Life and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust too. Um, so uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce Professor Dave Goulson. Um, Dave is one of the UK's most influential and respected people in nature conservation. His uh, day job is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex, specialising in the ecology and conservation of insects, and especially bumblebees. Um, but he's also interested in pollinators more generally and the management of uh, agro ecosystems. And Dave is a prolific author with over 200 peer reviewed articles. And clearly when not doing the day job, he's obviously on, on his computer writing books because he's written a series of brilliant scientific and popular books, which I'm sure many people on the call have uh, seen and read including the latest, The Garden Jungle, which is sheer genius in my view, probably the best book on gardening there is and should be read by every gardener in the country in my view. Uh, and in 2006, he founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and in recent years has become involved in the uh, impacts of pesticides on bumblebees and has made a major contribution with others to, to European policy. So after you know published research that he, he and others have produced, um, the EU introduced a ban on neonics, uh, a temporary ban, sadly. So uh, this remains a contentious issue that is sadly still alive. But uh, anyway, that's enough from me. And it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Dave Gilson to, uh, to address the, the group. So over to you, David. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for the introduction. And, and thanks to Get Cumbria Buzzing and the Wildlife Trust for, for organising all of this. And inviting me up. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Um, anyway, so I, I'm going to talk to you about insects tonight, of course. Um, you know that, I hope. Uh, I've, I've 
been interested in insects all, all my life. Um, from the age of five or six years old, I remember collecting these little yellow and black caterpillars I found by the uh, side, on some weeds in the school playground. And I put them in my empty lunchbox and took them home and reared them up. And they eventually they turned into these um, scarlet and black moths. You probably realize the cinnabar moths. And it was just, I thought that was just the most amazing thing. Um, and somehow I've managed to make a career out of chasing around after insects. I still have caterpillars in, <laughs> in boxes. Um, I, the problem is I can't see what you can see. So I, I can only see, I'm sitting here in my study and uh, I think you can see me in the corner alongside my slides. Um, but I can't tell where this is, whether this is really showing up. But anyway, this is, this is a, a Madagascan emperor moth, if you can see it. Beautiful thing, but actually some of our native insects are just as spectacular. Um, I think most people go through a, a kind of um, bug phase when they're when they're young. This is this is Seth, my uh, ten-year-old son. It was taken a couple of years ago. With it, he had a, a pet cockchafer called Colin. Um, sadly, Colin's no longer with us, but. Um, uh, uh, but Seth's still in his bug phase. He loves insects, um, and uh, and long may that continue. And I think many people do when they're young. They're curious. They love to hold things in their hand to 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 keep them in jam jars on their windowsill or whatever. But the the sad truth is that um, by the time they're teenagers or adults, most people's reaction to anything that buzzes near them. Um, is to swat it um, or to panic and flap their hands around because they think it's going to bite them or sting them or give them a disease or whatever it is, I don't know. But many people don't really have a very positive view of insects, sadly. And that's a real shame, partly, I think, because they're amazing and beautiful, but, but also because, of course, insects are really important. So my kind of mission in life, if you like, is to try to persuade people to love insects. Um, or at the very least to respect insects for being important and I'll explain how they're important in a little while. But let's let's just briefly touch on the sort of background, the big picture, the very big picture. Um, so this is this is obviously is our home, this is our planet, it's this amazing unique uh, round rock hurtling through space with maybe 10 million species of animals and plants clinging to its surface including us and it gives us all everything we, we need, a home, clean air, water, food, and a source of inspiration and, and beauty and, and so on. Um, and I, it's it's a, a source of perpetual mystification to me that we're making such a mess of our planet. Um, it, it ought to be the, the thing that we hold most dear, the, the sacrosanct, but, um, but as you all know, we're doing t terrible things that are damaging our planet. Uh, the climate we all know is changing um, and it's in danger of becoming a runaway event but that's just one of a whole uh, suite of environmental um, problems we've created. We're eroding soils around the world, we're polluting the air, the soils, the rivers, the seas with plastics and pesticides and heavy metals and all sorts of other chemicals and we're chopping down the rainforest and you, you get the idea. We're making a pig's ear of our beautiful planet. My real focus is on is on biodiversity loss um, uh, and when you start talking about biodiversity and, and its declines, many people, they immediately think of big charismatic um, animals, things like uh, rhinos or tigers or whatever, pandas, um, things that are on the edge of extinction and that are large and charismatic. Um, and that's understandable, but uh, I think until very recently, um, we'd missed a, a more concerning, a more uh, damaging change that had been going on, which is, well, two things really. One is the decline in bioabundance, the fact that it's, it's not all about extinctions. Um, something that I think is more serious is that things that used to be common are much less common than they used to be. The number of wild organisms has declined dramatically. But also, we've been paying much too much attention to the big things, and we've forgotten about what's happening to the little things, the insects and their relatives. Until, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, 
2017, when a study emerged from Germany, I was one of the authors, but I must say I, I did very little of the work. And it was all based on um, the work of, of um, entomologists in Germany, some of them amateurs, who since the late 1980s have been running malaise traps, um, which catch flying insects. That's a malaise trap top right there. Funny looking thing, looks a bit like a kind of badly put up tent. And it can, but anyway, flying insects bump into it and they fall into a pot of alcohol. And what the, the graph shows you is the, um, the weight, the biomass of insects caught per, per day, per trap, between 1989 and 2016. And they sampled at 63 sites all across Germany. Um, and you can see straight away without, you don't need statistics to tell you that the number, the number of insects or the weight of insects fell pretty dramatically. It actually fell by 76% in 26 years. So three quarters of the insects disappeared right across Germany. Now all the evidence we have suggests that isn't just some, this isn't something peculiar to Germany. This is something that's, that's happening around the world um, so far as we know. There are big knowledge gaps but every long-term study we have of insects is showing declines. And I, I could show you lots more similar charts but I'll just spare you too many and show you a, a couple. Um, so this is closer to home. This shows you, this is a different kind of information. This is not biomass. This is um, the average range sizes, the number of occupied kilometer squares um, in the UK for hoverflies, um, surfidae, which is the orange line at the top, and for wild bees, um, which is the blue line. And um, as you can see from 1980 onwards to, towards the present, um, uh, the ranges have contracted. Each species is on average found in fewer places than it used to be. Overall, on average, they've contracted by about 30% since 1980, which, you know, I can remember 1980. It really wasn't that long ago, it seems to me. Um, the, net, uh, the net result of those changes is that on average, each any particular site in the UK that you might care to visit has about 12 fewer hoverflies and bees than it would have done if you'd gone there in 1980. So we're slowly one by one uh, seeing our species shrink away um, and eventually if these ranges keep contracting of course they'll go extinct. And indeed some insects have already gone extinct. I'm just going to give you one example. This is um, this is actually a, a bumblebee from the west coast of North America, Franklin's bumblebee. Um, lovely thing, and I'd love to show you a nice picture of one on a flower, but the best I can do is show you a picture of one with a, with a pin through it, because it's extinct. Um, the maps show you where it used to live, the red dots. Um, so that's the, the, coast, the west coast of the United States. The southern part of the map is California, and the northern part is Oregon. So it used to live on in across those two states, but it started rapidly declining in the 1990s and uh, hasn't been seen since 2006, uh, which explains why I haven't got any nice pictures because we didn't really have digital cameras before this bee disappeared. Um, so some are gone forever, sadly, but uh, as we'll, we'll return to this later, thankfully most of our insects haven't yet gone extinct. Now, why do the insect declines matter? Um, this was answered by Wilson, who's a, a now very old American biologist. And he said, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. But if, in, so basically, um, if, if people were to disappear, the world would do just fine without us. Um, but if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. Um, and I think he's absolutely right. And, and I want to explain to you why. Uh, why is it that these little creatures are so important? Well, so insects themselves make up the bulk of life on Earth. They um, comprise, we've so far named about one and a half million species of animal and plants. We think there's many more, but of the one and a half million we've named so far, about a million are insects, so two-thirds of everything we know about. There may be 
four or five million more insects that we haven't yet named, but we know of at least a million. So they, they are biodiversity or a very big chunk of it. But also they're food for a very large number of the organisms that aren't insects, like these beautiful bee eaters. Um, in fact, many, many species of bird eat insects, as do things like bats, many lizards, frogs, and fresh water. If they didn't have insects to feed upon, and if you're a, for example, a bee eater living in Germany, then we know that three quarters of the flying insects that bee eaters feed upon have disappeared in the last 26 years. Um, which inevitably is going to have knock-on effects for, for the creatures that rely on them for food. But insects do umpteen other things as well. Um, so, for example, things like ladybirds and hoverflies and lacewings are um, important biocontrol agents. They help to control pests. Admittedly, the pests are also often insects, so they can be, they can be insects that are less beneficial. Um, insects are involved in all sorts of nutrient cycles. Uh, for example, dung beetles help to break down dung, obviously, um, and recycle the nutrients uh, that are, otherwise would be trapped in the dung. And uh, burying beetles, that red and black beetle there, um, help to recycle dead bodies and ants disperse seeds and insects help to keep the soil healthy and they do all sorts of things. There's not really any biological process that happens on land or in fresh water that doesn't involve insects. And I just want to tell you a little bit more about a couple of these insects that are sort of my, uh, not my favourites, but uh, ones that are, I think, are, just to illustrate that basically all insects are really fascinating if you, if you look into them and find out a bit more about what they do. So let's just talk a tiny bit about this thing. Um, this is the larvae of a lacewing. Um, it's a, tiny little creature, um, you might think it looks a bit odd, um, uh, rather ugly, but it's it's fascinating. It uh, has these big jaws, you can see there at the left, uh, these sort of scimitar shaped jaws, which act like hypodermic syringes, and it's, it preys mainly on aphids, green fly. And it stabs the aphid with its jaws and it sucks the juice out of the aphid, but then this particular species uh, of lacewing likes to put the dried husk of the aphid on its back. And so it looks so weird because actually it's got hundreds of, of dried uh, aphid husks tucked away on its back in this kind of crazy hairdo. We don't know why they do it. Um, maybe it's some sort of camouflage disguise or I don't know, it just likes doing it. We, we don't know. Um, anyway, if important creatures from, for, for biocontrol because they eat the pests of our crops. As in fact do earwigs. Earwigs are much maligned creatures. People used to think that they were pests and in fact the owners of orchards used to sometimes spray insecticides to kill earwigs because they do occasionally, they nibble on the blossom in spring and sometimes if fruit is bruised they'll um, nibble on the bruised part of the fruit. But actually they're, as pests they're utterly trivial. And it's been discovered much more recently that they're really important biocontrol agents. Again, their favorite food, once more, are aphids and other small insects that uh, live on trees. So earwigs tend at night, they, they're nocturnal and they climb up trees at night and they scoff all the aphids. So in an orchard, they do a fantastic job of keeping the aphids under control. Um, uh, it, it, it was calculated that a healthy population of earwigs in an apple orchard does the same amount of, of biocontrol as as, a far, as the farmer spraying three times with insecticides. Um, so those earwigs, if you look after them, they're doing the farmer a great service. They're also really just quite cool insects. I mean, it's funny that people think, I don't know, see, people tend to be frightened of earwigs because they've got those little pincers, but really, I mean, they're tiny little pincers. They can't actually hurt you. Um, and what people don't know is that they're actually they're really good parents or mothers at least. The female earwig makes a nest and she tends to her eggs, she licks them to keep them clean and when they hatch she looks after them. Um, so you can see here the little clutch of eggs and the, the newly hatched little nymphs around her, uh, the baby earwigs. Uh, so it's an unusual example of an insect that shows parental care. Um, uh, which is rather sweet, when, when the, although they're not the perfect mother, because when the uh, offspring are about half grown, she shoes them out of the nest. 
to go and fend for themselves. And if they won't go, she eats them. Um, so, so she's not, uh, you know, not not perfect. It's a good story if you've got, um, you know, children that won't leave home. Tell them about the earwig. Um, anyway, earwigs, fascinating and and much misunderstood creatures, as are so many of our insects. Of course, the thing that insects do, uh, the, the, the positive thing that is most familiar to people, is pollination. 87% of all the plant species in the world need pollinating by some kind of animal. And in some parts of the world, that might occasionally be a bat or a hummingbird. But the vast majority of that pollination is done by one type of insect or another. Um, bees are, of course, most famous for being pollinators. There's a lovely bumblebee there, top left. Um, but actually, pollination is done by thousands of species of insect. Um, just in the UK, um, it's estimated that there are maybe as many as 6,000 species of insect that contribute to, to pollination, um, including moths and butterflies and a whole swathe of different fly species and, and wasps, uh, as well as all the bees and probably a bunch of other insects too. So as well as, oh, I forgot this was coming up. This, I couldn't resist putting this in. Uh, so bees get more of the credit for pollination perhaps because they work so hard as pollinators. And there's a reason for, for bees working harder as pollinators than other insects, which is that they don't just eat the pollen themselves, they, they collect it for their offspring. So bees eat pollen and nectar throughout their lives, nothing else really. Um, and if you compare that to say a butterfly, a butterfly drinks nectar as an adult, but the, the caterpillars eat leaves generally. Um, but the adult bee has to visit a lot of flowers to collect all the pollen and nectar it needs to feed its offspring back in the nest. And they've evolved a whole bunch of techniques for um, uh, and, and, and structures, phys uh, physical structures to help them uh, do that. So, for example, they, uh, many species of bee have baskets on their legs to carry the pollen and they have branched hairs which help the pollen stick to them. And you can see this bee has been very, very successful at getting pollen to stick to it, so much so that it can barely fly, I think. But it, it illustrates very nicely that why bees are good pollinators, because you can imagine every flower that bee touches is going to get uh, pollinated pretty effectively. So as well as wildflowers, um, bees and other pollinators are vital to us, because roughly three quarters of all the crops we grow in the world need pollinating by some kind of um, insect and um, so if we didn't have insect pollinators we wouldn't have strawberries or raspberries or blueberries or apples or pumpkins or courgettes or even things like um, coffee and chocolate all depend on depend on insect pollinators um, so as we've, we've grown used to our supermarkets being awash with this amazing array of exotic fruits and vegetables from around the world, but things wouldn't look so good if we didn't have pollinators, as you can see from this mock-up in a supermarket. Um, and it would be impossible to feed the, hum the human population of the planet a healthy diet without all the fruit and veg that depends upon pollinators, aside from the trauma we'd feel from doing without coffee and chocolate. So we really need to look after them. We need to avoid ending up like these people. These people are and pollinating their um, apple and pear trees in southwestern China um, because there aren't uh, any bees left or any other pollinators left to do it for them. They've essentially wiped them out. Um, and so now the people um, act as bees. They send their kids climbing up to the higher branches. Um, it's pretty hard to imagine a, you know, a, a UK farmer hand pollinating his oilseed rape field. So we need to make sure we don't end up um, in this situation. Um, uh, it's funny, isn't it? Those pictures, they look kind of sweet, really. They're in their traditional dress and everything, but actually it's, it's a pretty chilling sight. There is an alternative solution to the bee crisis, which has been suggested, um, which is rather than looking after the bees, we should um, replace them with robots, robo-bees, drones, whatever you want to call them. And there are a whole number of labs around the world building prototype replacement bees, these little metal and plastic things that are intended to fly from flower to flower, or 
actually the latest one I saw was from a Japanese lab where they're they're building drones that will fly but they have little bubble machines uh, and they blow bubbles at the crop and the bubbles have pollen mixed in with the bubble mix which is hence the picture of the flower with the bubble on it anyway um to me this this kind of fills me with dread the idea of replacing real bees with robot bees and I don't think it actually makes a lot of sense you think of the the energy and the resources that are going to be required you know how many trillions of these things are we going to need to pollinate the world's crops um, given that at any one point in time there are about three trillion honeybees in the world and that's just one of 20,000 species of bee forgetting all the other pollinating insects Could we, do we really want to start replacing them on that kind of scale um, and they're going to break down and litter the countryside and uh, worst scenario major hackers will break into the bebop control system and turn them against us um, it seems like a, a pretty rubbish idea when you think we have real bees right now which have been pollinating crops for about 120 million no, crops pollinating flowers for about 120 million years and uh, and they're really good at it uh, and they're, they're biodegradable and they're carbon neutral and they're self-replicating they seem to be have all the properties that you would want of a pollinator so why on earth would we be planning to replace them it seems completely nuts to me so okay if we're going to reverse these declines of insects then we need to understand what's driving them and and it's complicated there's been quite a lot of research done on this we don't know all the answers yet um, but it's pretty clear that there are multiple causes and I've I've put them down here in what I think might vaguely approximate to the order of importance, but um, there's a lot of guesswork there. Certainly, one of the biggest drivers of insect declines has been loss of habitat, and I'll say a tiny bit more about that. And and the adoption, the widespread adoption of pesticides, and I'll say a little bit more about that too. I haven't got time to talk about the others, but um, there are all sorts of other issues. Climate change in particular probably hasn't had enormous impacts so far on insects. But if the projections are correct as to what our future is likely to look like, then they will have climate change is going to have really profound impacts on our insects in the coming decades. Anyway, let's just say a tiny bit more about habitat loss. So certainly from a pollinator's perspective um, and from a UK perspective, the, the biggest habitat change in the landscape uh, the most adverse impact on uh, pollinators has been the loss of our flower rich grasslands of course that's what get cumbria buzzing is all about is getting more um, flower rich habitat back into cumbria and we need more everywhere um, we used to have about seven million hectares if you went back to 1930 seven million hectares of flower rich grasslands much of it lowland hay meadows and chalk downlands and some upland meadows um, and here's an example of one of the surviving patches this is in south uist in the outer hebrides absolutely beautiful and teeming with insect life um, and for obvious reasons you know it's rich in flowers it's rich in a, a huge diversity of of, of flowers um, uh, and un uh, unfortunately we we got rid of something like 98 percent of this habitat in the 20th century uh, we swept it away and replaced it with monocultures of crops or monocultures of ryegrass for silage production and it's pretty obvious you don't really need to say any more of why that that's going to have had devastating impacts on on wild insects we've also changed the landscape pretty profoundly um, and there was a recent paper published which included these aerial photographs not of the uk this is of western france um, but similar changes have gone on all over Western Europe, and I think the changes in the British landscape would look similar if I could have found equivalent pictures. So these are four aerial photographs of exactly the same place, the one top left taken in 1958 and the one bottom right taken in 2010. And I, I just was really struck by how dramatic that, that how profound the landscape change has been in not much more than my lifetime. Um, uh, you can see top left, you know, the landscape was full of little little fields with lots of different crops and there would have been fallow fields and lots more edges and corners that, that, that 
had room for wildlife. Whereas today, or 2010, um, just a few big fields with very few margins, very little crop diversity, um, just a more boring, sterile landscape altogether. And it, because it happens slowly over you know 50 years, we don't really see it. We, I, I can't really remember what the landscape looked like when I was a kid, but clearly it looked quite different. Okay, so I won't say any more about habitat loss. The other, the other driver of declines, I'm just going to tell you a tiny bit more about, are pesticides. Now, this is a big subject, um, and and I, I, I can't, I haven't got time to say more than a few words. But um, modern farming um, has um, in, in, involves a lot of pesticide use and an increasing pesticide use. Um, to give you some figures from the UK. Um, uh, according to government records, farmers apply 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticide to the landscape every year. That's herbicides, fungicides, molluscicides to kill slugs and snails, and insecticides to kill insects. But they're all poisons. That's 16.9 thousand tonnes of poison that we put onto the landscape. And each arable field in the UK, according to our own government figures, uh, get 17.4 applications on average, 17.4 applications of pesticide per year, um, which is a figure that's increased 80% since 1990. So pesticide use is getting worse. We're using more and more of these things. And it's hardly surprising that, that our farmland is not teeming with life anymore um, when you consider that we're endlessly spraying it over and over again with chemicals designed to kill everything but the crop, essentially. So what can we do? Sorry, this has all been really doom and gloom, um, but from here on in, it's a little more positive um, uh, because there is lots we can do. It's not too late. Insects on the whole haven't followed Franklin's bumblebee to extinction. They're still with us and they breed really fast, much quicker than rhinos. They'll recover if we provide them with somewhere to live, something to eat and stop poisoning them. Um, and the nice thing about it is everyone can get involved. So a lot of these big conservation issues, people feel completely helpless. You know, what can you do about the, the rainforests or climate change or whatever? You feel at least that anything you do is inconsequential. But with insects, you can do things in your garden, even in a window box, and you can see the benefits uh, within hours. Um, so let me talk through some of the things that we might do. Well, first of all, I think there's a huge opportunity to make gardens and urban areas more wildlife friendly, more insect friendly, and to turn our, our, our urban areas, our cities and towns and villages and individual gardens into a, a giant network of insect friendly habitat. There are about half a million hectares of gardens in the UK, plus all the cemeteries and road verges and roundabouts and parks and other urban green spaces, spaces that could be managed for wildlife. Um, and if we could we could do that. And I think this is kind of, it's, it's like a no regret solution. It's an easy win. There's no, nothing really that we have to compromise over here, apart from perhaps learning to be a little more, um, a little less tidy. Um, and we could invite insects in to live in our cities. Um, and so I'm going to talk mostly uh, for the rest of this talk about what individual people can do in their gardens if they're lucky enough to have one. I'll say a bit more about farming at the end. Um, but when it comes to uh, making your garden insect friendly, sorry, this is terrible, but I couldn't resist putting in a plug for my book. There it is, The Garden Jungle. Um, it's all about how, how to make your garden more wildlife friendly, more insect friendly, and also about how to tread more gently on the planet. Available from all good bookstores. Don't buy from Amazon, please. They don't pay their taxes and they squeeze authors so that we get hardly anything for every book sold through Amazon. So other online online bookstores are just as just just as efficient and only a tiny bit more expensive and worth um, the extra. I would say, of course. Anyway, sorry, I'll move on from my uh, self promotion um, and tell you what you can do in your garden to make it more insect friendly. So some of the things I'd encourage you to do involve less effort. And one of the most obvious ones is mowing less. So we Brits are, are a bit obsessed by our lawns and many of us 
um, aspire to having a kind of Wimbledon tennis court with stripy lines up and down it um, in our garden. Um, but if you stop mowing, if you can, if you can persuade yourself next time you get the urge to mow to instead relax and make a gin and tonic or a cup of coffee and sit down and just watch the lawn, then you will see it come into flower. Um, if you just leave a lawn for two or three weeks without mowing it, the first flowers will usually appear without you doing anything to encourage them. them. This, this is my lawn. And I never sowed any wildflower seeds in it. I didn't do anything. It's just the lawn that came with the house I bought. And as soon as you stop mowing it, you get red clover, white clover, buttercups, dandelions, self-heal, speedwell, all sorts of things have just popped up and started flowering and the, attracting in hordes of bees and butterflies and all sorts of other things. As soon as you mow it, you get rid of all the flowers, you get rid of most of the herbivorous insects that might have tried to move in, the grasshoppers, the caterpillars, whatever. You actually are effectively hoovering them up with your mower, which sucks any insects stupid enough to move onto your lawn up and macerates them. Um, so if you don't mow, you will eventually have a lovely rich community of insects. If you do mow, you'll have basically bugger all apart from a stripy lawn. Um, so um, please just try and mow less. And if you can leave some areas and just cut them once a year, then even better. If you don't have a garden, um, you might get involved in some uh, local community campaign to, to do similar things with our, our urban green spaces. So I used to work up in Stirling in Scotland. And uh, there is this wonderful little group of local people. Um, they call themselves On The Verge. And um, they spend their weekends um, with permission, digging over any bit of amenity grassland they can get their hands on and sowing it with wildflower seeds. And at the last count, there were just below 100 patches like this dotted around Stirling. So this is a road verge. And you can see on the other side of the road, the boring mown grass that used to be on this side of the road, but that they've replaced with flowers. Doesn't that look fantastic? Um, and here's a, there's a roundabout um, also in Stirling. Um, wouldn't it be great? Just imagine if every roundabout, every road verge in Britain was covered in flowers like that. I think that would be amazing. On a similar vein, I think it'd be great if we could persuade people to be a bit more chilled about, um, about weeds. A bit like lawns, um, we have a natural tendency to try and tidy to be neat. And we've decided that some plants are undesirable, that we just don't want them for whatever reason. Um, um, even though in many cases they're beautiful. Um, so things like dandelions and knapweed there on the right and thistles and I, there are many, many others um, that are regarded as, as things that should be persecuted, that you're a bad gardener if you have these things growing in your garden. But actually they're just native flowers. So if I had one tip for you to remember from tonight's talk, you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden, just like that, by calling them wildflowers. And oh dear, I don't need to say anything, do I? Why do we, why do, we do this? This is, this is very common. Many, many towns um, uh, you can see often little uh, four by four quad bikes with tanks on the back spraying glyphosate onto any patch of green that dares to show its face along the streets, along the edges of the children's playgrounds and parks, paths and all sorts of places. This is completely nuts. What harm was that little bit of vegetation doing? We really need to stop using pesticides in our towns. And I don't think they're necessary at all. Um, France recently banned all pesticides um, in urban areas. The stuff that was used to kill this bit of poor vegetation was almost certainly glyphosate, which um, has there's a huge debate at the moment, but a considerable body of evidence suggesting that it's a carcinogen in humans. Do we really want this stuff spraying all over our pavements and in our gardens and in our parks where our kids play and our dogs play and so on? Seems like a bad idea to me. So I'd get rid of all pesticides. I'd follow France's line and just ban them for use in gardens and urban areas. You don't, you really don't need them. Um, I find. I actually have very few pest problems in my garden without using any pesticides. Um, I do have aphids. And I kind of think that's good. If you have aphids, then you'll have enemies of aphids. You'll have the insects that eat them and the aphids will never get out of control. As soon as you spray an insecticide and kill all the aphids, you also kill all their enemies. 
And the aphids inevitably come back and they come back much faster because their enemies have all gone. And then you end up with a much worse pest problem. So if you find there are some aphids on your roses or runner beans or whatever, um, just try and hold your nerve and do nothing and wait for the cavalry to arrive. And all these beautiful creatures will, will magically appear. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just messing up my own screen here. Um, so you probably recognize most of these, um, but these are all creatures that will eat um, aphids for you, save you the job of trying to kill them yourself. We saw the lacewing earlier. Uh, we've got hoverflies and ladybirds and parasitoid wasps and earwigs and soldier beetles and so on and so on. Um, I, just as a matter of interest, you might want to test yourself on your insect identification. I wonder how many of you know what all of these things are. Um, because the hoverfly and the ladybird and the lace winger all have two pictures, one of the immature and one of the adults. And I'm sure you know the adults. Um, but do you know which um, immature insect is, uh, belongs to which one? Probably you do, but just in case you don't, uh, uh, the top centre, that's a young ladybird that will turn into a, a ladybird eventually. Uh, bang in the middle, that delightful creature is uh, a hoverfly larvae, one of the species of hoverflies that have larvae that eat aphids and it's busy scoffing an aphid right now. And of course the lacewing larvae top left we met earlier and that turns into this rather beautiful kind of lime green insect on, on the middle on the right. Anyway, all of these insects are common in gardens if you just don't kill them with sprays unnecessarily and they'll all get rid of the pests for you. Okay, so something else on a different tack that you can do, and a pretty obvious thing, is you can make your garden more pollinator friendly by growing the right kinds of flowers. Um, and all flowers originally evolved to attract pollinators, but many of the ones sold in garden centres are no longer attractive because we've messed them up. Plant breeders have selected for things that they thought were nice uh, and often made the plants for insects because we've changed the, the shape of the flower um, we've selected for whatever properties we thought were attractive and uh, the plant has the flower has lost its original purpose and that's really nicely illustrated by these two pictures they're both roses of course the one on the right is close to a wild type rose and it attracts heaps of insects um, you, the, the pollen is produced by the anthers those orange bits in the middle one on the left is a hybrid tea rose, the kind of common garden roses that people usually grow. It's a mutant in which those anthers that produce the pollen have mutated into extra petals. So it's basically a bundle of petals uh, with no pollen at all and bees can't get into it anyway. So it's useless. You might think it looks pretty, but from a bee's perspective, that thing on the left there is an abomination. Uh, get rid of them and next time you're buying a rose, buy one like the one on the right. Similarly, many annual bedding plants, the kind of things that uh, you see outside a garden centre or supermarket in the spring in disposable plastic pots, um, most of these are pretty useless. So don't bother with any of them. Um, the gnome is just a, a personal thing. And instead grow basically traditional cottage garden flowers um, and herbs. There's loads of information out there. Look at my YouTube site. I've got a whole bunch of videos showing you the best uh, flowers for pollinators at different times of year um, and I, I, I haven't got time to go through them all now but I just wanted to show you pretty pictures of things like catmint which is a lovely flower really easy to grow and bees absolutely adore it. Um, geraniums, um, wonderful plants, this is the native uh, meadow cranes bill but there are uh, related garden varieties nearly all of them are very attractive to bees not to be confused with pelargoniums which are related to geraniums, but are from South Africa and are pretty hopeless for pollinators. There's things like borage, which are very easy to grow, and bees love it. Lavender, fantastic stuff. Uh, comfrey, not the most spectacular flower, but bees go crazy for, and it's also really good for making compost and liquid manure, so it's a great plant to have in the garden. And also squeezing some wildflowers. So again, people often think that wildflowers are weeds, um, but actually many wildflowers are stunningly beautiful and deserve surely a place in our, even in a formal herbaceous flower bed or whatever. Things like Viper's Bugloss top left there, which I think is, is one of my favourite wildflowers to grow in the garden. It's flowering now, 
looks absolutely stunning, grows about four feet tall and it attracts a whole cloud of insects. If you've got room, stick in a flowering tree or two. Um, obviously, if you've got a very small garden, that may not be practical, but trees, when they flower, because they're so three-dimensional, they're so tall, they can provide food for thousands of insects at the same time. If you stand underneath a lime tree when it's flowering, the whole tree is humming with insects. Um, so if you can squeeze in a lime or a laburnum or a horse chestnut, or apples have the advantage, and fruit trees generally, um, that you can get dwarf varieties. So even if you've only got a tiny garden, you might well be able to squeeze in a, a small apple tree. And the blossom will feed the pollinators, and in return, the pollinators will ensure that you get fruit later in the year. And also by planting trees, you're capturing carbon. So it's, it's winds all round. Do beware when you're choosing plants for your garden that the ones on sale in your garden centre have almost certainly been drenched in pesticides of a whole range. Um, we studied this quite recently in my lab at um, Sussex Uni. Uh, we screened plants from all the local garden centre chains, including the big places like Wyvale and B&Q and Homebase and so on. We bought the plants they were selling as bee friendly. They often have the RHS's perfect for pollinator logo on them. And we screened them for pesticides and nearly every single one contained pesticides. 75% um, contained insecticides designed to kill insects and they're being sold as bee friendly. 70% contain things called neonicotinoids, um, which are a type of insecticide that are notorious for being incredibly toxic to insects. And they're in bee friendly flowers in the garden center, which is absolutely outrageous if you ask me. Much better, find an organic nursery or grow the plants from seed or do plant swaps with your friends and neighbors. Much better way to do it. Also beware on the subject of neonicotinoids that although you may have heard these chemicals, neonicotinoids have been banned from farming use, they're still the active ingredient of uh, the most popular flea treatment that people drip on the necks of their dogs and cats. So in tiny letters on the front of this packet of Advocate, um, it says imidacloprid, um, uh, just above the word fleas. And imidacloprid is a neonicotinoid insecticide. And the amount of insecticide you're supposed to drip on a medium-sized dog's neck every month uh, to stop it getting fleas is, is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. And this is a water-soluble chemical which will come off your dog if it goes out in the rain or swims in a stream. You've got a huge dose of insecticide going straight into the, into the river. It's something I've got a PhD student studying at the moment, and she's got some really scary findings so far. Anyway, do be aware that you really, th these are potent neurotoxins that you're dripping on the family pet. Um, I think there are better ways of controlling fleas. I'm running out of time, so I, I, I won't go on a rant about peat, but um, please don't use peat-based composts. If you don't know why, look at my YouTube video, which will explain why in more detail. Uh, terrible for the environment to use peat-based composts. They should be banned. There are perfectly good alternatives available. Um, and best of all, make your own compost in the garden. OK, there's two more things I'm going to suggest you can do in your gardens. One is put up a bee hotel or make a bee hotel. Uh, these are intended to provide homes for solitary bees, which are um, make up the majority of the UK's 260 bee species. Um, and Many of some of them like to nest in horizontal tunnels, uh, which are in short supply in nature these days, but are very easily provided or created simply by drilling uh, holes in a piece of wood. And this ugly thing on the left is a fence post that is slightly rotten, so it doesn't look great. But I drilled some eight millimeter holes, and within 20 minutes, I had my first red mason bee top right there turning up to inspect. And now there's a thriving colony in there. And you get the red mason bees early in the spring, and if you're lucky, a few other species of mason bee. And then at this time of year, uh, you get leafcutter bees move into any holes that the mason bees haven't used. Uh, that's a leafcutter bee, bottom right, snipping bits of leaf to lie in the tunnel, uh, which is what they prefer to do. Gorgeous little creatures. You can make much more attractive things than that. Um, as I say, get a neat block of wood and drill nice neat holes in a, in a pattern, if you like or slice up bits of bamboo cane and put them in some kind of box. 
or if you've got no DIY skills at all, buy one. There are lots available and some have windows on the site so you can see what's happening inside. And these are really cool. Um, this is one made by a company called Nurturing Nature based in Liverpool. Um, and you can see my kids love to peer in. You can see on the right there what you see if you take that little door off the side. And there are those little piles of yellow pollen with developing bee grubs, each separated by a little wall of clay. Those are all offspring of the, the red mason bee. Really fascinating, a great way to engage kids. One final thing you might do in your garden to encourage insects, much less well known than the bee hotel, is make a hoverfly lagoon. Um, these uh, are to provide breeding sites for some species of hoverfly which don't have larvae that eat aphids. Instead, their larvae are aquatic. And they're really fascinating, weird creatures with long snorkel tails. So they have a long tail from which they get their common, rather unfortunate name of rat-tailed maggot. Um, but it's actually a snorkel. That tail goes up to the surface um, of the water and enables them to breathe. And these type of a hoverfly like to breed in tiny puddles with rotting organic matter in them. The larvae actually eat the bacteria. And it's really easy to create them in even in a smaller thing as a get a large plastic milk bottle and saw it in half and use the bottom of it, fill it with water, chuck in a handful of leaves. As soon as it starts to rot, um, you'll you'll find that these beautiful hoverflies, two species there on the right, which are important pollinators, um, will come and lay their eggs. Works really reliably. Again, you can find a YouTube video with more details about how to make them, but it's really simple. OK, I'm aware I'm running out of time, uh, uh, but before I finish, I just want to say a few words quickly about farming, because the sad reality is that no matter how wonderful we make our gardens, um, I don't think we can support all of Britain's wildlife in gardens. There are many species that, that won't live in gardens. Um, and 70% of Britain is farmland. Um, and unfortunately, much of that is now fairly hostile to insect life. Um, and I think it's a really one of the biggest questions facing mankind is, you know, do we have to push on down this industrial farming route or is there a more sustainable way to feed everybody? Um, I think there actually are. Um, and I just want to briefly try and explain why I think that. So one option would be to go organic, to get rid of the pesticides. And I think that's a pretty attractive option. But a counter argument, which is usually raised at this point, is to say, but well, organic farming doesn't produce as, as the yields are lower. And therefore, you'd need even more farmland to feed the 7 billion people on the planet. And there's going to be 10 or 12 billion of us fairly soon. And that's a, that sounds on the face of it to be a good argument. Um, but currently, we produce about three times as many calories in food grown around the world as we need to feed the human population. Um, we have a staggeringly inefficient food system. Nobody starves in this world because there isn't enough food. They starve because they can't afford to buy it. There's more than enough food out there. Um, so we grow three times as much as we actually need, but then we waste a third of it, um, which is just ridiculous. And another third of all the calories we grow are fed to animals in intensive indoor animal units. Overall, about 75% of all the farmland in the world is used to produce meat, uh, which comprises about 8% of our calories. So three quarters of the land is producing 8% of the food. Um, that is ridiculously inefficient. Um, so if we could massively cut down on food waste and we ate less meat. Um, we could, I'm not saying we should all be vegetarian or vegan or whatever, I'm neither. Um, we should just treat meat as a luxury because it has a much bigger environmental footprint than growing vegetables. Um, we could easily go organic. We could get rid of all the pesticides in the world um, overnight if we were prepared to be less wasteful and eat a little less meat. It doesn't seem like such a big sacrifice to me. Um, but also, as uh, uh, we eat too much and we eat the wrong kind of stuff. Sorry, this is an awful picture to put up. It's, um, it's not a pretty sight, is it? But, uh, but it's, it, it, I think it's important to be aware that we have an obesity problem, both in the UK and globally. 27% of adults are obese and rising, because we largely because we just eat more than we need 
and we're eating it unhealthily. We're eating lots of processed food based on cereals and fats and nowhere near enough fruit and vegetables. So what could we do instead of the sort of industrial model of farming with huge wheat fields and oilseed rape fields? Well, at the other end of the spectrum is kind of home growing garden vegetable patches and allotments. Um, and I, I, this is something we've been studying allotments near the University of Sussex in the last few years. And I've learned some really interesting things. So firstly, garden veggie patches and allotments can be extraordinarily productive. They can produce up to 35 tonnes of mixed fruit and veg um, per year. That's zero food miles, healthy, often pesticide free, but not always. Um, zero packaging, healthy fruit and veg available for immediate consumption by the people that grow it. Um, 35 tonnes per hectare compares pretty well with industrial farming, which might produce eight tonnes a hectare of wheat, say. But more than that, um, there was a recent study from the University of Bristol, which showed that um, allotments are the richest places for insect life um, of any urban habitat. They're richer than gardens, they're richer than parks, richer than cemeteries, richer even than urban nature reserves. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because it shows something really interesting. You can produce lots of food and have high biodiversity in the same place. Um, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, can they be scaled up to feed everybody in the world? Because clearly not everybody has time or inclination to have an allotment. Although I, actually, as an aside, I would love it if government tried to find more land for the 90,000 people on waiting lists for allotments. But that's still not going to feed everybody in the world, is it? Um, but these kinds of ways of growing lots of different fruits and vegetables together um, can be scaled up. And there are various models of, of usually thought of still as slightly quirky kind of um, left field approaches to farming. They're not yet mainstream, but I think show huge promise. Things like agroforestry. These are just two pictures of agroforestry schemes, which combine trees into, into the cropping system so that the, the land is never left bare and it holds the soil together, it captures carbon, it can produce fruit, um, and also it supports a lot more biodiversity. There are things like permaculture systems, um, which can be enormously productive. Just look at that picture, all those lovely fruit and vegetables being produced by a small permaculture farm. And biodynamic farming, which is sometimes slightly wacky they they have elements of what appear to be witchcraft mixed up with a whole bunch of really sensible practices um, including relying on natural enemies to control crop pests and focusing on soil health above all else um, uh, ways of growing food that are properly sustainable and that can support biodiversity at the same time i think we can do it um, but we just need some imagination to go down that route Basically, I think we need to, I would love it if we could ring our cities and towns with intensive vegetable and fruit production uh, grown without pesticides in, in the way that I think is epitomized beautifully by this picture. Anyway, just to wrap up, sorry if I've overshot slightly, we started a bit late. Um, back to our lovely planet, it's an amazing thing and it, it, it's so depressing that we're making a mess of it, but we don't have to. Um, you know, it, I find it astonishing that people would do anything for their children apart from apparently leave them a decent planet to live on. We have to do better. You know, there is no planet B, to use the cliche. Um, and I, I think we can. And I think we should start by, uh, by inviting wildlife in to live in our towns and cities and by looking after our insects. Thank you so much for bearing with me. That is the end. Well, Thank you very much indeed, Dave. That was absolutely fantastic and uh, really powerful, informative and inspiring. So thank you very much indeed. And while you have a quick breather, we do have a, uh, a quick poll that we would like the audience to, uh, to uh, fill in, if that's possible, in the next 60 seconds or so. So if people would like to vote, um, we'll come back with the result in a moment. Uh, while Dave has a, a slurp of water, we'll... We also have lots and lots of questions that have come in and through the talk, which uh, we have time possibly for a five to 10 minutes worth of questions as well. So we'll ask a few of the, uh, the questions that have uh, come in from the audience. 
So uh, if people would like to uh, to press the screen or use your cursor to vote and submit, that would be great. How are we doing, Rob? How many people have voted? Okay, so there we are. That's where we have the results. So uh, I think you've done a brilliant job, Dave, of persuading the uh, the viewers to uh, do something different and take some action for insects. I can't actually see the results at the moment. Oh, no. so, uh, so we've got uh, yes, make a change. 83% of people uh, want to do something for uh, for invertebrates. 2% are not sure. And 14% say, no, I already do everything I can. Um, That's pretty positive, isn't it? Great. It's pretty positive, I'm yeah. Delighted. Um, and nobody says they're not going to do anything. Probably most people that are that are listening are already at least somewhat engaged, or else you wouldn't be here in the first place. Um, but I, I do think there is huge potential to, to you know, um, if we could spread the word and get to all the people that aren't here, you know, people talk to their friends and neighbours um, about, you know, maybe persuade them to put in a few more bee-friendly flowers, question them if they start blasting pesticides around the garden, make them feel a bit guilty about it. Um, just try and get more people engaged because I, uh, it really worries me that, that we're in the bubble, you know, that those of us that care about the environment, um, we're, we're on social media shouting at each other and we, we all agree with yeah, each other. 90% right. yeah. of the population out there are not listening, sadly. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, are you okay to answer a few questions? We have a, we are yeah, over of course. a little bit of time. But first question. Um, can the self-seeded oil seed rape in my garden that's coming from a neighbouring farm, can it contain pesticide residues that are harmful to bees? Probably not. The amount, I mean, there the would be small amounts in the seed, um, but by the time it's grown into a full-size plant and flowers, um, there would be negligible amounts. That's quite different to when a farmer buys a seed that's been deliberately coated with lots of insecticide, um, to, to permeate the plant as it grows, then obviously that is harmful. But the the residue that's left in the seed that blows into your garden is probably fine, I would guess. That's uh, very reassuring because we hear all these stories about um, uh, roadside verges being full of uh, toxic chemicals from the neighbouring fields. So that's that's good to hear. Um, next question: uh, What do you think the shortcomings are in government policy around this this issue? And what should we be lobbying for do you think for those that care yeah so i mean i i think the key really is i mean we've got we're obviously in a really interesting time with brexit and the agriculture bill going through parliament at the moment um for me the the, the thing that government could do that would have the biggest benefit would be to use the farm subsidy system to to radically redirect farming um, you know currently we spend three and a half billion pounds a year on subsidizing farming that's taxpayers money going to farmers it makes up about half their income on average um, and in the past most of that money has gone as area-based payments so basically the big farmers the ones that had the more land got more money um, and we've been told that we're switching over to a new system in which, in which the, the subsidies will only be given out in, in exchange for public goods. But the, the devil is in the detail, and, and um, that could be fantastic. You know, if farmers only get their subsidy, if they're really looking after biodiversity, they're really looking after the soil, they're farming in a properly sustainable way. You know, in my dream version of the world, that many more of them would be organic, and maybe they'd be growing fruits and vegetables and using agroforestry techniques and so on. You know, we could push farming in that direction, but using those existing subsidies. But if we end up with a really watered down scheme that actually ends up being quite similar to what we used to have, then and we just carry on subsidising industrial farming as we already know it, then yeah. that will be disastrous, I think. 
Yeah. So that's something very clear we can be talking to our MPs about, particularly as the agriculture bill goes through at the moment and uh, the government is developing elms, as you say, over the next year or so. So yeah, big opportunity. Yeah, it's, it, it's I, I sort of think we could go in either direction. You know, we could have a this um, wonderful green future or we could end up in a trade deal with Donald Trump and, you know, a race to the bottom. And I'm not, I, I fear the latter is probably marginally more likely than the former, but uh, time will tell. Kind of, kind of, the next question is kind of related, uh, which kind of links into um, yesterday's announcement of build, build, build. Um, do you have, do you, uh, do you have confidence that the 25-year environment plan will be, will be implemented and acted upon? I, I, I don't. I mean, I'm, I must admit, I'm slightly sceptical, and I really worry that, um, particularly, the, the government seems to be desperate to to boost the economy at all costs and. You know, it would it would be nice if uh, at some point governments went to the fact that focusing all of our efforts on trying to grow the economy, regardless of the COVID situation, um, you know, is not sustainable in the long term. We cannot just simply grow and grow and grow. And my worry is that they're going to actually throw um, uh, environmental principles and protection out of the window so that they can build houses everywhere and new motorways or rail links or whatever because they seem to think that just throwing money at projects is the way forward and i heard heard someone from the government saying on the radio yesterday that uh, they didn't want newt counting to get in the way of the economy recovering um which i was kind of terrified by because you can see exactly what they mean they don't want environmental actions to to prevent us from concreting over the landscape um, to build whatever it is they decide to build. So um, I'm fairly terrified, actually. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure many would agree. A um, couple of more kind of wildlife questions, insect-based questions now. One from somebody that says, uh, there seems to be a lot of insect and plant life around at the sides of the roads at the moment. Any ideas why? Yeah, um, so it's, it's really, I mean, definitely this spring seemed People seem to have noticed insect more, um, and I, I don't know whether that's because um, because of the lockdown and the lack. For a while, there was a there was much less traffic, uh, and it, I mean, obviously, the traffic itself kills a few insects. Um, maybe the pollution from the traffic has effects that we don't haven't really been studied, to be honest. But maybe they do. Um, Maybe it's the warm, you know, we have had a pretty warm and pleasant spring on the whole. Or maybe it's just that people are noticing them more because we've had a bit more on our hands these last few months than, than we normally do. Uh, I honestly don't know, but it is nice that there do seem to have been um, generally more insects about. You know, I've seen lots of small tortoiseshells this year, which I've barely seen for decades. So, there, you know, maybe there's something we should be cheerful about. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And here's, here's a nice question. Um, how do bumblebees make their buzzing sound? <laughs> so from one it's, extreme to another. Well, it, it, it's a, there's a horrible fact that I, someone once told me, which is that if you chop the wings off a bumblebee, um, it still buzzes. So it's not it's it's the flight muscles basically, and the the contractions of the flight muscles blast air in and out of the trachea on the sides of the insect, and it's that combined effect that. Um, that makes the buzzing noise. Great, good, good. Um, and a couple more questions to go, I think, and then we're probably running out of time. But um, somebody asked, um, somebody's a student who's currently doing a dissertation around bumblebees and is asking, would you say there's a bit of a romantic idea about conserving and reintroducing species like this into the landscape? Hopefully they, they don't want to, you to write their dissertation for them. But, um. <laughs> so I, I'm not quite sure what they're getting at. I mean, it, there has been an attempt to reintroduce a, an extinct uh, uh, bumblebee back to the UK, um, unsuccessful, sadly. But we, I was involved in a, trying to bring the short-haired bumblebee back to Kent, um, which died out in Britain in the 1980s. Um, but that, we tried to introduce them from Sweden and it didn't work. Um, but I don't know whether perhaps this question is more about um, rewilding and the notion of bringing back bigger animals, and which has really caught the public imagination in, in recent years. Uh, and I think he's quite excited. Do you think wilding is good for insects? 
Yes, uh, I mean broadly, um, certainly I, I, I do a bee safari every year at, at NEP, which is a long way from Cumbria, but it's this rewilding project in West Sussex that uh, has got a lot of attention and certainly for some insects it's now fantastic i mean it's it's got the the it's, i think it's the second biggest population of purple emperor butterflies in britain from a baseline of none at all um in 15 years um uh, and it's it, it's basically teeming with insect life so um yeah in short and it's i Obviously, we do have to grow food, and we have we can't just rewild the entire landscape. But the interesting, I, I think, we could rewild some of the less productive places. And and NEP, although it's in lowland England, was on is on this really horrible soil. My garden's on the same soil, and it's really difficult to grow um, to to make a living as a as a farmer growing crops on it. So if you can't, you know, if it, it doesn't produce much food, perhaps some areas like that could be rewilded. I'd love to see a you know a rewilding project in every county. I think it would really nicely complement the existing network of of nature reserves and moves to make our urban areas a bit wilder and more full of flowers. Mm, absolutely, and um, obviously NEP also produces many many tons of uh, beef and venison every year. So and uh, pork, so it uh, it is producing food still. Yeah, well, although, although uh, per hectare it produces rather little, um, I think it's for, yeah, for me it's more of a conserv it's more of a conservation project than a farming enterprise. Okay, uh, two two final questions, just very quickly. Uh, what's your view of I'm a celebrity? Get me out of here. <laughs> the whole eating live insects and stuff and make, putting people in tanks with them. Oh, I, I don't know what to make of it, actually. I mean, it's kind of sad, isn't it? The, yeah, yeah, no, words fail me slightly. Sorry. Uh, quickly moving on then. Uh, what do you think, just to sum up, really, what's the single most important thing you think we need to do as a nation to make a difference to the, I, the I think I think we need, we, we need to somehow, I kind of think we're close to a tipping point that, you know, that the, the world is changing. People are waking up, but we need to wake up quicker. Um, you know, if you see things like Extinction Rebellion and the rise of veganism, there's all sorts of interesting things going on that suggest that people are finally waking up to the fact that we must look after our planet. But we somehow need to get that accelerated. And we need to we need to elect politicians that actually care about the environment. And, you know, there were, again, signs of that in the last election with all the, the, the bidding war as to who could plant the most trees. Um, but... I don't think that was that was all a bit dumb, really, and uh, childish even. Um, but at least it showed that politicians recognise there are votes now in environmental issues, and but we need that to be done really seriously. And, um, and so basically, we need to win over enough people, and I think that's probably the key thing. You know, I mean, I could say everyone listening plant some more bee-friendly flowers, but they're probably already doing that. It's it's, it's the bigger picture. How do we change the whole way the country is run? Um, and that, I guess, is by electing politicians that also care about the environment. So um, somehow we need to we need to change the politics of this country. Mm. Well, on that very profound point, I think we probably need to draw the evening to a close. And um, I'd just like to say a massive thank you. And I can hear the ripples of applause from around the country. Massive thank you to <laughs> Professor Dave Goulson for your uh, for your really fantastic uh, talk and for answering the questions and for spending your time with us this evening. So thank you ever so much. And, good luck the book. and uh, you know, let's let's uh, continue this work uh, to uh, to avert the insect apocalypse. Um, so thank you very much indeed. And just finally, I just wanted to say uh, a massive thank you to Phil Sweetland, uh, Tanny St. Pierre, Rob Davis, Charlotte Rowley, Amanda, Nicola, Lucy, and all our project sponsors, uh, the players of the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Howard's England, for making tonight possible. So thank you very much indeed. And most importantly, thank you to all the uh, viewers for watching and joining us. And uh, please do take action back in the real world for insects. And we hope you've enjoyed the evening. And uh, stay safe and good night. And may the buzz be with you. So thank you very much indeed. Good evening. <laughs>